Today she's telling us about her research on bearing witness <coughs> to global change, our obligation to tell the tale. Welcome home, Liz. Thanks, Craig. And thanks to everybody. It's, you guys have seen several people in this position already, so you know that it's been a long process for me. And it's been fun, and I thought I had about a half an hour before this talk, but I had about five minutes. So <laughs> I haven't really kind of um, gotten everything in my head sorted out, but it's been a pleasure. It's really been interesting. Virtually everyone I've talked to, in fact, everyone I've talked to, I could have talked for longer. It's been really fun. And I have to say, because I came from here, but also because I can still see it's true today, um, I've had conversations with this with Marvely for many years, is the potential of this place and IB is just unbelievable. And you guys are really, really lucky to be surrounded by the expertise and the interests and the people that you have here. So it's been a pleasure for me to be here. Um, my seminar today is going to be a little bit self-revealing. And I intentionally did not send an abstract because I'm going to be talking about a taxon that is perhaps a little unexpected. So um, I hope everyone can see this okay. So somebody probably in here knows what the distribution, what this distribution map is of. <laughs> <laughs> this is a distribution map of the Annie Alexander collection. <laughs> this distribution now, hint, is Joseph Cronell's. <laughs> so my view of this museum and this collection, and this is just a keyboard, right? Two early founders of this place is that the MBZ itself is a biodiversity reserve. So I started my career working in Yellowstone, looking. I was interested in discovery in pristine areas. I actually articulated from my master's through my PhD that I wanted to work in a landscape that was relatively unimpacted by the human footprint. I wanted to <coughs> discover what a natural ecosystem was like. This is the extent of our national park system. And just with these two people, we cover more of the US in, the, in this collection, in the MBZ collection, than does the National Park Service. With respect to the history of this place. And now it's global, right? So you've seen me present this already, future warming, but here, is when Joseph Grinnell died. So in 1939, since then we have doubled our temperatures. And in the next time, about equivalent to 1939 to present, we will more than triple our global temperatures. But it's not just climate. <coughs> Human population is growing at a rate that's remarkable. October 31st of this year, marks the seven, you know, kind of artificial seven billion mark. So here is Joseph Grinnell off this graph, his death. You know, since that time, we've more than tripled. And by 2100, you know, if the fertility rates are the same as the average of 2005 to 2010, we would be close to 27 billion people on the planet. So if we somehow manage to bring fertility levels in the world down to replacement level, just replacing ourselves, we could maybe stop at around 10 billion. <coughs> in my mind, global change involves not just climate change, but human population growth. There is no place on the planet, no species on the planet, that is currently unaffected by this. And in my view, the museum should play a greater role in thinking about how we understand that change. So the title of my talk is Bearing Witness to Global Change, Our Obligation to Tell the Tale. When Yellowstone was founded, it was this beautiful place in the midst of wilderness. This is the boundary of the western side of Yellowstone today. We have no hope of establishing reserves in North America that are anything like the vision that 
um, that Yellowstone and National Parks like Yosemite uh, established. This is our view. This is the landscape that we have to deal with. So Yellowstone was established in 1872. I started there in 1982, basically working on in what I thought of as a wilderness. I ended up addressing what is the natural baseline of Yellowstone. I started there working on whether or not this species, the elk, was native. It was extraordinarily controversial at the time, scientifically relatively uninteresting. But it turned out to be very, very, a very hot topic because there was overgrazing. Wolves were not native. The work that I did was foundational for reintroduction of the wolf to Yellowstone because I established that wolves had been there for 3,000 years, long before Europeans got to that place. These are the bones from the cave that helped to do that. So the Holocene fauna of Lamar, uh, Lamar Cave in Yellowstone, served as the first documentation in a national park of what the native fauna really was before Europeans got there. It was a complete documentation, and this cave and another cave, Waterfall Locality, comprise 95% of all the species in that park. In 1988, fires hit Yellowstone. The Yellowstone fires of 88, I was excavating in my cave with ash and big chunks of wood falling on fire outside the cave. I had Helitac crew helping me haul stuff in and haul stuff out, and I had masks over my face, and I wore Nomex gear so that I could get to my cave. And when we had to pack up our stuff, our belongings, what did I pack, right? Most people had photos and their personal belongings. I packed my bones. <laughs> so I had all my bones packed in my car. I had enough room to sit my body in my little Subaru, and the rest of it was filled with my fossils. This article that came out on Sierra, I spent time interviewing them, and, and they were talking, I was saying, look here, 960, year, 960 years ago is evidence of another fire in Yellowstone. It happened a thousand years ago. Wow, what happened a thousand years ago? I started working. It was the medieval warm period, another period of warm and dry climate. Suddenly I thought establishing the native ecosystem wasn't just about documenting a list of species, but it was about describing the resilience of that ecosystem in the face of a changing climate. So 3,000 years of climate change in Yellowstone. This is a fire reconstruction. The medieval warm period here, warmer, drier, probably somewhere around one degree temperature warmer. This is the plant response showing this basically an increase in sagebrush with, sagebrush with respect to grass all consistent. Then I documented the same thing with small mammals. Consistent. Really interesting. Remember talking to John Hart about his, his uh, experiments in the Rocky Mountains. Gosh, look, the voles decline, the ground squirrels increase. It's all consistent. It's consistent. I started actually, and I'm sure Dave will remember this, I found 3,000 specimens of salamanders in Lamar Cave. And I thought, gosh, I want to work on these. And he gave me all this literature, and I had other things to do, and I work on mammals. But I started to kind of work on them a bit, and I collaborated with a master's student in Bozeman when I moved to Bozeman as an assistant research professor. And he went out, and together we kind of uh, we focused on the area around the market. And we said, let's just sample these ponds, because I want to understand a little more about the salamander diversity. I was out there trapping mammals. I don't know what to do with salamanders and frogs. So he did that for his master's thesis. And this was my view of how amphibians might have been affected by climate change. Climate warming would lead to a decrease in effective moisture, would lead to a loss of pond habitat, and then pond amphibians would be lost. So I expected to see population declines during the medieval warm period. Before I get into what I found, so yes, I'm going to talk a little bit about amphibians. <laughs> Before I got into what I found, I want to give you a little bit of the background about Yellowstone and the geologic landscape because it's really important for thinking about amphibians. Yellowstone was a separated ice cap. It was covered by over a mile of ice, basically everything in the park except a little bit of electric peak, which was a noon attack sticking above the ice, was covered by ice. So the entire modern ecosystem of Yellowstone assembled in the last 12,000 years. 
However, when the glaciers were receding, they left big chunks. Not only do they leave these erratics, which are classic glacial erratics that you see on glacially modified lands landscapes, but they also leave big, big chunks of ice. And those ice uh, pieces <coughs> result in uh, a morphology that dominates the landscape with what are called petal ponds. They're also terraces. So this is a very glacially modified landscape. These are kettle ponds here. All of these are ponds. And Slough Creek Lamar Cave is over here. This was, there was a valley glacier here. These are cane terraces or streams that ran along the side of the glaciers. And it turns out this is a beautiful place for amphibians. All of these little ponds are inaccessible to fish. And in Yellowstone, there aren't tiger salamanders where there are fish. So this is a schematic of these chunks of ice being left by a receding glacier. Glacial till covers them, and you're left with these kettle ponds. This is a photo down Slough. This is a kind of a view toward the west down Slough Creek. You can see these abandoned oxbows. Again, beautiful places for amphibians to breed. You can see the cane terraces and this hummocky terrain, very glacially modified. The Yellowstone amphibian community is not tremendously diverse. These are pretty common amphibians that are very widely distributed. The Colombian spotted frog, the boreal chorus frog, tiger salamander, and the western toad. Some of you guys might look at this fauna and think, how boring. It's a northern, it's nothing like tropical diversity, right? There are no beautiful blue things and red things. But this is a north temperate, relatively high elevation amphibian fauna. So these are the 49 ponds that we went out and sampled. Lamar Cave is about right here. We went everywhere and sampled these ponds. And it turns out there's a, there's a comparison that's important. There are some of the ponds that seem to be permanent and some of the ponds that seem to kind of come and go during the year. So they are filled with water in the spring and then they dry up. And we call these ephemeral. So in 1992 to 93, this was the status. We went out, we looked at what the diversity of the amphibians were, and we kind of described and articulated the pond status. I'm going to point out right now that tiger salamanders, for those that don't know, in relatively deep permanent water have an alternative lifestyle where they remain in water as axolotls, reproduce this way, and basically they skip the terrestrial lifestyle unless the water dries up, and then they can also, you know, metamorphose. This turns out to be interesting, and it set up this really intriguing idea in my mind that maybe there would be really different genetic structures that would be in response to climate change. That in cool, uh, wet periods, you might find increased structure because the tiger salamanders would perhaps not need to metamorphose and leave the pond because the ponds didn't dry up. So, I had this question about population size change and this life history question, and I asked, how is Ambystoma tigrinum affected by climate change? It took me a while to do this project, and I did it in collaboration with Webb uh, Long and Judson Bresgel, who's a grad student. Webb was an undergrad in my lab. Um, and it turns out, this is the key that Dave Waite gave me so long ago, that you can distinguish whether or not uh, the amphibians are metamorphs, or pedomorphs, and whether or not they're larval, and you can also measure their body size. The answer, though, was <coughs> not, population size did not change. What changed was how much time the salamanders spent in the water growing versus on land growing. So it was a change in the timing of events in salamanders. You know, I didn't expect that, and it was really interesting to discover this. It got published, and then I kind of left it alone until I had another graduate student. And also, that was about the time that I started becoming more receptive to global amphibian decline. And I realized that, it, you know, there definitely are, there's reduced habitat, there's some sort of disease operating here, there's climate, there's over-harvesting going on in Asia. There are definitely a lot of onslaughts, and I just wanted to understand more about what was happening with amphibians. So the stuff coming out of Costa Rica, partly because of Alan Pounds and other people, global decline linked to chytrid, 
to the fungus chytrid, and also to climate change question mark. <coughs> that led to a modification of my simple, oversimplified idea of what would be happening to amphibians. That I incorporated the idea that there might be changes in how much time these amphibians spent in different life history stages, development and phenology. And then increase of risk of disease certainly could be at interacting synergistically with stress perhaps induced by change in effective moisture. <coughs> so this just became kind of a paradigm for thinking about how climate might have changed. So together with a graduate student, Sarah McMenamin, who's now a postdoc um, with Dave Perici in Washington, Amphibians occupy this dynamic landscape, and we have kind of 3,000 years of records of this, of 3,000 years of a record. Has the, the hydrologic landscape changed? And, so, and, and this took me a, not very long, but I thought, wow, I have all these old records old, 1992 to 93. And so I decided to look at those, and I set Sarah on this task, and we ended up collaborating with Remote Sensor. We did a pond resurvey, those 49 ponds, she went back and visited every one. And we ask how are salamanders affected, both in terms of genetic diversity and morphology, and has the amphibian presence across the landscape been affected by this at all? So we resampled the ponds, we added the size and developmental stage as one of the things we looked at, and we took genetic samples of all the amphibians, um, uh, or of, of a subset of the ponds, but all the amphibians in those ponds. <coughs> So the very first thing we found is that the permanent ponds have axolotls. They have these beautiful or weird, depending on if you're an amphibian biologist or not, uh, uh, creatures. And we, um, were, we managed to get uh, DNA. I think to my knowledge, this is still the, the only ancient DNA of tiger salamanders or of salamanders in, in the world. Is that true, Dave, so, do you know? No. So we, we actually had, Sarah was very diligent in the lab. We have 700 base pairs spanning D-loop and cytochrome B for, um, for uh, 16 samples from the last 3,000 years, and every one of them is identical. So the genetic diversity in this landscape is pretty low. Um, it's, it's somewhat structured. Um, this is mitochondrial DNA. It's, it's very, you know, the effective size is pretty low. And what's interesting is that Lamar Cave, in spite of all of this climate change, there's like no changes in the genotypes that are represented. So it also turns out that these ponds are more diverse, perhaps because they're permanent. That's what these initial mitochondrial data suggested. <coughs> so we use serial coalescent analyses. We use, this one is just ancient data. This is ancient and modern. We have three different evolutionary rates. Probably the appropriate evolutionary rate of mitochondrial and D-loop evolution is somewhere between one and, and a quarter percent uh, per million years. And, but nevertheless, the probability is really high that the effective size of the population that the Lamar is derived from is pretty small, two or 300 females. And even when you <laughs> add the, uh, the modern data to that, it's still reasonably small. And remember, this is across the landscape. So there's clearly structure playing a role in uh, when you add the, um, the modern data. And for those of you who work with population genetics, you certainly know this, but your power gets so much more limited when you have no variation. <laughs> you need lots of specimens to understand what that means. Um, so one of the questions we had is, this, you know, the source of the ancient samples is, is either very local or perhaps this whole thing is evidence of some sort of colonization bottleneck, and there's just not a lot of diversity from that to draw from anyway. And so Sarah then extracted DNA from microsatellites uh, from 15 ponds, and these were structured to look at ephemeral ponds and permanent ponds. So can you guys see in the back the green ponds versus the blue ones? So what you see here, here is an isolation by distance model. In looking, these are just comparisons. These are pairwise comparisons between ponds that are permanent and ponds that are not permanent, so the ephemeral, and these are between permanent and non-permanent ponds. So this is kind of your average. There is an isolation by distance. The further you get away, the more there are differences between the populations and microsats. But permanent ponds 
have more diversity than do ephemeral ponds. <coughs> Pond type also influences body size and how much growth occurs. So in all these different weather uh, measures, so the first ephemeral pond dried on the 30th of June. So this is um, data collected over three years, all basically correlated with date. And what you see are the permanent ponds in all stages grow to be larger. And in these guys, size is correlated with, fecundity is correlated with reproductive output. Um, Overall, when you look at June, July, August, um, and permanent ponds, which you, so these are ponds that dry in June, in July, and August, and permanent ponds, the longer the salamanders spend in the ponds, the larger they are, whether they metamorphose or not. So Sarah came up with this idea that says, you know, she kind of modeled this. Sarah, salamander life history is a little plastic in this dynamic landscape. Small metamorphs predominate in ephemeral environments. They have low annual reproductive output and high terrestrial mortality. That's the other thing that she scanned from the literature, that the larger you are, the easier it is for you to escape predation and to, to live through desiccation events. Large metamorphs predominate in permanent environments. They have higher annual reproductive output, and there is more gene flow between ponds. And penomorphs are found only in permanent environments. They have very high annual uh, reproductive output and there is no gene flow between ponds. Yellowstone ponds are disappearing. So here's where I tell you about what we've seen in at this point it was 17 years. So 1995, 2005. And of course we didn't think to take pictures in 92 and 93 anticipating just less than a, you know, two decades in the future that there would be a change. So we scanned, we got these from courtesy of Terry McEnany, who's a bird ecologist in, in Yellowstone, and we tried to match them. This is a slightly different time of year than this. These are exactly both the same time of year. This is something I noticed, the rangers noticed. People who have been in Yellowstone have noticed, but it's all anecdotal. Ponds seem to be drying up. What's that? What's the water table determined by? What is the lag time of these ponds? How long does it take for them to fill? <coughs> Nobody knows the answer to that question. And it's not just the amphibians that depend on these ponds. It's all the bird life as well and the mammals that are associated with them. We went back and, and extracted data from old remote sensing uh, uh, images. So in 1992, these blue areas, this is just a snapshot. We did this for the entire northern range, but this is a snapshot that shows these blue areas were wet, right? Here it is in 2007. You can see a reduction in, for exactly the same time of year, a reduction in the amount of wetland habitat in Yellowstone. And we quantified this. We compared it to temperature change. There's been a very slight increase in temperature from 1950 to 2010. Gosh, that really didn't explain it all. There's been a very slight decrease in precipitation. Gosh, that didn't explain it all. But the combination of the two of them and lag time result in what's considered, this is from a Palmer Hydrologic Drought Index. It's amazing. So here's the Dust Bowl years. So here we go, 1900 to 2008, I believe, is the end there. And you know, these are, this is the Dust Bowl years. Here we are. In the, this is what we witnessed, is this particular set of events. The most severe droughts and the longest persistent droughts in the last hundred years. This is what regional drought looks like. This is a Palmer Drought Severity Index. This is basically something that fire managers use to predict uh, the severity of fires in the summer. And this is for April 2008. The West is, as many of you know, drying out. So here are our pond data. The number of ponds that are permanent has decreased. 2008 turned out to be a very wet year, so there was a slight increase there. All of these are significantly different than 92 and 93. There are more uh, ephemeral <coughs> ponds than there, than there were, uh, I mean there are fewer ephemeral ponds and more completely dry ponds. Ponds that didn't even have water in them after the snow melt, melted. In uh, all the, the number of populations, so the number of places that we actually sampled these four species. So Bufa boreas, we don't have enough data to, to actually test this. 
but in all of the other, in the other three, the number of populations declined in all three amphibian species. Species richness declines. Wow, there's not even a single pond that has all four species today. Every single measure of diversity shows a drop. There are many ponds now, the majority of ponds, um, uh, not the majority, but many ponds that have no amphibians in them. We found evidence of desiccation events. So this is just in a matter of days. The ponds were drying too fast for these guys to metamorphose and leave. But we also found enigmatic mortalities. Mortalities where there would just be, the surface was covered with dead amphibians and there was still a little bit of water left in the pond. These were mostly attributed to some sort of fungal death, perhaps. This is Sarah in her collecting gear. And the results of this were that I just couldn't believe it. I mean, this was an accident. We witnessed this change. I witnessed this with my own eyes. Salamanders are affected by desiccation. The drought in Yellowstone, we could document this because we had these data. We could document how common, I mean, how much more common drought was. A 400% increase in the number of permanently dry ponds, how can that not influence these animals that depend on wetlands? Population declines, 42% of amphibian, um, I mean, of ambistema populations lost, 68%. 76% populations lost. So, another mortality is prevalent. That was never documented in our initial surveys. So, climatic warming, in this case, in, you know, this pristine area, there's no drills for water. This is, it's already affecting these populations in Yellowstone. So, that kind of puts you, in my mind, where I am now with my work. I realize that I can't spend my, the rest of my career going to these pristine areas. I feel like it's important for me to communicate what I've seen. So I'm continuing to work on the western U.S. 20,000 years of vertebrate diversity. I will continue to do this in the Great Basin, in Yellowstone, wherever I can. I will continue to address South America um, in Patagonia for the same reason. But I'm now starting to work in Costa Rica. It involves no paleontology, and I'm interested in how diversity and disease um, are affected by landscape change. And in particular, in this study, which I'll talk about in just a second, I'm interested in how human fragmented landscapes influence the diversity of vertebrates in general. We're looking at the 10,000 year record of Anolis lizards in the Caribbean the evolution of the Himalayan pikas at high elevation, at the high elevation plateau, and the slopes up to that, which are almost vertical, in the Sikkim province of India, uh, dominated by humans. Almost everywhere you look, there are humans. And we're, I'm also with Uma Ramakrishnan looking at the assembly of Indian biodiversity, and I'll just dis describe this in a second. We're doing some forward projections of tiger persistence. So I'll continue to use these kind of topical areas to guide my work, but I'm increasingly thinking about trying to make predictions that make a, different, a difference and that are generalizable um, around the world. The tiger population, <coughs> the, the challenge with tigers is that they've been reduced to something um, on the order, they, they've been reduced by 90 to 98% of their historic size in just 200 years. So there are 3,000 tigers left in the world, and in India there are 1,000 left. This tiger, for example, is one that's adapted to swimming in mangrove forests, threatened completely by sea level rise. But tiger populations are separate from each other. What we did is we, so Uma Ramakrishnan has been looking at She's been looking at non-invasive samples of tiger, tiger feces in India, and she's gone and sampled tiger skins, mostly in uh, the UK. And so she's done a lot of historic baseline work to say what, are, what, are the diversity of, what, were the, what was the diversity of tigers uh, historically. What we decided to do in my lab is actually take the serial coalescent models that I've been going back in time with and go forward with them and ask, 
okay, let's just say, let's take, let's take the genetic diversity of tigers that we have now, which is actually not so bad. How long, if we just manage tigers like this, like they are now, how long will it take to lose that? What's going to happen in 150 years? So we set these models, we set this model up to investigate how long it would take if we allowed no interbreeding between these subspecies, or if we allowed complete panmixia. And this is the historic estimate of population size. This is when tigers were completely dominating all of this part of Asia, right? Historic population size. There's no possible way we could maintain that today. Conservationists are just talking about building population sizes, but it's all local population sizes. So what this means is we will lose the genetic diversity we have in tigers very, very quickly unless we sink the subspecies and basically take, you know, crossbreed tigers from different regions. So that's a controversial topic and, and a very interesting one to think about. This describes a bit of the Costa Rican project. We're looking at forecasting the evolution of insectivorans. So species dependent on insectivores that perform very important ecosystem services in the tropics across a changing landscape using species traits, mostly traits involved with dispersal, population genetics, and genomics. And here the objective is not only to try and reconstruct the, the history of the populations and their structure, but to actually see if we can extract the evidence on that structure of human change to the landscape. And we're asking whether or not there are traits that we can identify that help us make predictions elsewhere in the world about which of those are the most susceptible to human domination of the landscape and which are not. This is the landscape. These are intact areas. This is Las Cruces National Park. These are our study areas. This is in a collaboration with Gretchen Daly, who's done an immense amount of countryside biogeography. And we're working on um, amphibians. We're working on birds. And we're working on bats. And we've got a comparative study of congeners where we're looking at supposedly kind of specialists in general to try and investigate this. So. I just was really, this is from this week in my freshman seminar. So the questions I was asking when I was a freshman <coughs> in college are a lot different from the questions <laughs> that these students are asking. One student said, a quagga, is this what it looked like? That is my favorite animal. <laughs> One student said, is it possible to even kind of rescue a species when there are only 250 left? I'd like to find a way to figure out what species used to be there and then try and put them back there. Can you major in this? <laughs> <laughs> what is it that makes people want to eradicate smallpox or the guinea worm, but not something like a tiger? What does charisma mean when it talks about species conservation and extinction? So I was really struck by the fact that these students, these 18-year-olds, right, are asking <laughs> questions of science that we aren't prepared to answer. And they're not the questions I was asking. I was, as, I was out for discovery. I was out for finding the wild. These guys are not. They're out to kind of make a difference. And I, and I think we need to kind of come up with ways to answer and address those questions differently. I think the MVZ is in a beautiful place to do this. I think we can lead this kind of science. I think we should continue the fundamental discoveries about how evolution works in genomes, populations, and species, of course, we should continue to do that. We have the tools, the data, the knowledge, the experience, the international profile, and the prestige. The MVZ is a leader of global change on campus. I think global change is more than climate. It's uniquely situated to be and serve links to the department of IB, which is amazing, and other museums and other departments on campus. The natural history reserves, I'd love to use them more as not only laboratories of evolution and, and global change, where we can manipulate and anticipate what might happen there, but also as places to teach people about the fundamentals of evolution and ecology. <coughs> of course, it would it's, of course, we have to develop new expertise in uh, genomics and bioinformatics and continue <laughs> what great work has been done here already. I think it's the place to train new scientific leaders. And I think one thing that could be 
emphasized is a lot more outreach, and by this I don't just mean to schools, but I mean to other disciplines. I love this history of science project in the museum. What an exciting thing. Ways to translate the value of these things uh, in the collection and the people here too. So I think the MBZ has all the pieces um, to do this. We have all the pieces and I think we have the ability to discover what the next questions will be and serve as a leader in that way. So these are my students and my lab again. And uh, here I want to acknowledge Melissa, who's doing the Caribbean Anolis work. She's gotten her first ancient DNA of Anolis. It's very exciting. Luke is doing the frog work in Costa Rica. Sarah McMenamin did the work in Yellowstone. Mason Churchill is a, a sophomore doing the work um, with Danny Carp in Costa Rica on looking at birds and their insect pollination, I mean, their insect insectivorous speech, uh, services. Uh, Christian Anderson and Uma were instrumental in the serial coalescent analysis, and Uma is just an amazing colleague working on tigers in India. Rachel is the one that did the forward projection and modeling. Uh, Zenju um, did the work with Sarah in terms of the microsatellite uh, data in the lab, and they do it all through the hope, right? Mm -hmm. So thank you very much for your attention, and I'm happy to answer questions. Thanks very much for sharing that uh, vision with us. So, yeah, any time for discussion and questions? Yeah. So those tigers. Yeah. Uh, so let's go back to thinking about geographically widespread different subspecies. They clearly weren't panmictic at any they time weren't. in the past. Right. So what your argument is is that is that in order to maintain the genetic diversity within one of those subspecies, you'd have to so breed across all of them. So. No. So we, we've done models where we've just looked at, so we just, we've done, I just showed you the one for the whole species. We've actually looked within India. There are three populations in India and there's the same kind of structure there. The point is that in order to preserve the genetic diversity, and genetic diversity and its value for sustaining populations is debatable, right? Yeah. But for example, the adaptations to the south, let's just think about that. How do you preserve those adaptations to the south? Do you just, you know, how can you increase the size of a Bengal tiger or those tigers in the mangrove forest and preserve that? There is no way to do that in those locations. You, in a sense, each of those, the locations where there are tiger subspecies today, that's kind of it. That's the only place. They're not going to create new tiger population habitat. They need 57 deer per acre to survive. They're not going to have that kind of land in Southeast Asia. So what's going to... The only way to save that particular set of genotypes is to spread them around. So no, I'm not arguing reproducing pen, you know, the population of the past. I think it's impossible, actually, to preserve that genetic diversity by doing just population size increase locally. It's impossible. So if you're willing to sacrifice the genetic diversity, then you're going to be man managing tiger by tiger. I think every tiger in zoos and in the wild is important. Does that answer your question? It's a little bit controversial, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if I can just follow up on that while other people are thinking. So, <clears throat> I mean, on the, the population genetic model suggests that the, the way that an effective way to sustain global effective population size is to allow subdivision or at least very low migration. You're saying that the, the individual pieces aren't sustainable. So contrasting, so if you can't keep multiple pieces, just keep one, but enrich it with so, from across so, the range. Right, exactly. It, so this sort of hard spec to the Florida So panther. what this, yeah. what, I, what I didn't say was that the genetic diversity, if maintained exactly the way it is now, there's a lag. Because of generation time of tigers, they haven't lost the genetic diversity they have. But if you do nothing, it will be lost population by population very quickly. So we actually did a model where we said, what if we do it now? What if we do it in 10 years? What if we do it in 20 years? So that's, that's actually the way to answer your question more appropriately, is that th there's a lag that has not yet expressed itself in the loss of genetic diversity. And the only way to salvage that right now is to start breeding tigers across national boundaries. David? I'm thinking about uh, 
what the fate of the Ambistema will be ultimately in, in that region. And if you compare them with the congeners in Mexico and the Mexican Plateau, it's kind of interesting because their uh, habitat has been modified by long-term human persistence. A lot of it's in the Valley of Mexico, right? It's huge population density. And there they survive by being pedomorphs in large permanent ponds. So maybe those few permanent ponds are the, the real uh, answer. Refuge. Yeah. The real refuge, yeah. So, so yeah, I actually, I think of all of those species, the tiger salamander is probably the one that's most likely to survive, right? Uh -huh. if, mm -hmm. if you were to just yeah. kind of push this extreme, or to the extreme. Mm -hmm. But the point is that, I mean, my point is that very short-term recent environmental change has already exerted an yeah. influence. And I think that's been happening through the past. I think one of the reasons why there isn't historic change in the genetic diversity of tiger salamanders in Lamar is because every single time those salamanders are leaving a permanent pond and colonizing an ephemeral pond and then getting selected by the raptors or whatever and eaten and deposited in the cave, they're going through colonization bottlenecks. And I think the, the, the ephemeral ponds maintain overall low genetic diversity on the landscape. You're right that the permanent ponds are the reservoir for the, the um, higher genetic diversity, but even they have been affected. Their, their persistence has been affected by the last 20 years. I'm just curious about this ambistema situation. So why do you think these ephemeral ponds have lower diversity? I mean, what's happening over time that's, that's uh, constraining individuals with lower diversity to be in those ponds and, and not in the permanent So, ones? you know, that question, to exactly answer that question, I think it involves, it would, it, we tried to do this. It involves both the dispersers, out, you know, out of the per pond and those coming into the pond. And Sarah tried setting up drift nets, and it just turned out to be extraordinarily cumbersome, and she could not do it for 49 ponds. But I'm, I think what's happening is that either those individuals, they're metamorphosing as fast as possible, or they die, right? So they leave, and they, there's probably a relationship with how far they can disperse and, and how far, when they come back, right? So they're, I think every single year that those ponds dry, they're going through a bottleneck. And so they're selecting from the, they're selecting somehow from the subset of diversity in the permanent ponds. And they're, every year, that's what they're doing. So those little populations, the metapopulation, those populations are going extinct every year. So there's not a lot of migration back and forth between, I mean, the ones Between the permanent ponds? Yeah. The permanent ponds are actually, uh, I didn't show you these data, but the permanent ponds are actually they don't form the same kind of isolation by distance. So when you saw that linearized FST, they're more different from each other than the, the ephemeral ponds are. So actually, ponds that are right next to each other will show much larger differences than two ephemeral ponds that are very far apart. So the permanent ponds are a little bit more structured, in part because there are permanent, you know, there are axolotls in there. There are salamanders that don't leave that pond, and that serves as a reserve, right? Paul. Would there be a way to model, um, like an area the size of Yellowstone or, or even larger, what the minimum threshold would be? Like how many permanent ponds would you need to be able it's to maintain? It's a great idea. It's a great idea. I don't see why not. I mean, do you see in your in your when you've been tracking those through the last 15 or 18 years? Are there some permanent ponds that are, seem to be large enough that they're not going to be in any danger of completely drying up? Or is there such so a thing as a pond, pond that's too big? So there's a pond called Ice Lake that's to the north. It's very deep. Mm -hmm. It's very cold. It's fed by, it's probably fed by a, a spring. Um, and that has the largest axolotls, mm -hmm. and they're cons you can always go and find them. It's definitely, whereas some of these other ponds seem a little bit more marginal. It's also protected. It's on a north-facing slope, mm -hmm. and it's surrounded by trees. So it's also protected. For, it doesn't get direct solar uh, radiation like some of these other ponds that are just exposed. Mm -hmm. So that mm -hmm. pond probably mm -hmm. is, a, is a really important reservoir. And, you know, <coughs> Sarah found this by looking at the very local scale, at a more regional scale, and the largest distance she measured, I think, was 300, three miles. No, more than three miles. Sorry, 30 miles. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, it would be nice to even go beyond that to see what what uh, the landscape, large landscape scale, looks like. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's a question at the back. Uh, Morgan. Um, yeah. So 
Your paleo work does a great job showing how communities are changing dynamically with changing environmental conditions over long time periods. At the start of your talk, you mentioned um, the idea of finding the, the natural community at a site. Um, and of course, 